and welcome to another episode of Stamper Cinema. As always, I'm your host. My name is Andrew. Thank you very much for downloading this latest episode. If you are new to the channel, please do me a favor and hit the old like subscribe button. So whether you listen to on Apple or Spotify or wherever, it'd be great. Uh, that way you get notifications anytime a new episode publishes. Or better yet, you can also check out my website, stampercinema.com, and you can subscribe there. So anytime a new episode posts, you get a little email saying, hey, there's a new episode out and you should totally check it out. Also on my website, there is a really handy dandy tool that if you are new and would love to be on the show, there's a little like sign up form and you can just leave a little information about yourself and I will reach out to you. And because we are on the subject of my website, there's also like a little tab for blogs. And if you're kind of like an older person, blogs are kind of like newspaper articles, but on the internet. And admittedly, I haven't done a really good job of keeping that updated, but that is going to change because I've got a brand new article that I'll be publishing next month. And the objective is to try to do some type of article each and every month. So we'll see. We'll see. But all of that is available on stampercinema.com. Now, for today's episode, we've got something really important in store for you. We are going to be covering The Notebook, you know, the 2004 film with Rachel McAdams and Ryan Gosling and, uh, oh my God, a bunch of other people based on the Nicholas Sparks book. Now, admittedly, I had never seen this film. And the guest and I were going to get into it. And actually, speaking of our guests, that's really what I should be transitioning to because this is going to be very important. We've got author Lisa Skinner joining us. Now, Lisa is a behavioral specialist who focuses on Alzheimer's and the like related dementias. And um, she's been in the field for well over two decades. And her story is very, very, hmm, what's the word I want to say, uh, impactful. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not the one to really share her story. So we're going to have her on and allow her the opportunity to share something that's just really, really uh, important. And the work she's doing is so impactful. So without further ado, let's just dive right on in. Again, Lisa, hello. How are you? Welcome. Hi, Andrew. I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We first connected a couple months ago and we, we've, we've, uh, We've had this on our calendar, and this is a conversation I'm really looking forward to. It's going to be, you know, um, it's 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 going to be a good one, and we're going to talk about a really really fun film about really not so fun subject matter. But before we get into that, if you wouldn't mind, just take a just take a moment to introduce yourself. Obviously, I introduced you introduced you in my my introduction, but if you can give us a little bit a little bit more about who you are, what is it that you do. Because obviously with the conversation we're going to have, you have a very personal story and very connected with this with this piece. So, And I'm not quite frankly entirely sure how, if I'm the one to really introduce it. So if you wouldn't mind just, again, introducing yourself and in, uh, if you feel comfortable sharing your story. Certainly. So my name is Lisa Skinner, and I have been involved in the Alzheimer's dementia space for close to 50 years. And 50 years ago, I had a personal experience with my own family member. It was, she uh, was my grandmother. And I'll tell you about that in a, in, you know, in a few minutes. But uh, since then, I have had a total of eight family members um, develop one of the brain diseases that causes dementia. And close to 30 years ago, I decided to work with families professionally. So I am what's called a behavior specialist. But I'm also a certified dementia practitioner. And I am a certified dementia care trainer. And I have counseled thousands of families over the decades to really help them understand um, this very, very misunderstood disease, very complicated disease, which 
uh, lasts a really long time. I mean, the average that a person lives with Alzheimer's disease is anywhere from eight to 15 years. My grandmother had it for 20 years after uh, the onset of her symptoms. So it is a very long course. And with that in mind, uh, it takes a lot of trial and error and challenges to get through it, whether you're a family member or a caregiver or the person who's actually suffering from the disease. So what I've learned, my biggest takeaway in all these years doing this professionally is the better you understand the illness and what it's doing to the your loved one or the person you're caring for, the more positive experience you as a family member or a caregiver will inevitably have because you'll have less stress and less frustration if you have a you know, really unclouded understanding of the disease and what to expect throughout the disease. You know, obviously this is a, you know, just a really, really intense subject, but I mean, you mentioned that like right at the outset, that this is a very, very misunderstood disease. And I don't know, not to put a very, very specific point on it, but I don't know, what do you think is perhaps like one of the most misunderstood elements about Alzheimer's and dementia? I'm going to answer that question kind of in two parts because Alzheimer's, a lot of people believe Alzheimer's and dementia are the same thing or that they are two completely separate diseases. So let me address that first. So, and that's not true. Alzheimer's is an actual brain disease. There are actually over a hundred brain diseases. This is surprising to many people uh, because the one that we're most familiar with is Alzheimer's disease. And then there's a couple others that have, you know, surfaced in the media and have been trending in the last few years. There's Lewy body disease. And, uh, you know, that's the one that Robin Williams was diagnosed with. And then most recently, Bruce Willis. So those are examples of actual brain diseases. And depending on which brain disease you have, it attacks different parts of the brain. But they're all progressive and there's no cure for any of them. Now, when we use the term dementia, that is not a specific disease. It's not a disease at all. It's actually a syndrome. And we use that term as an umbrella term to describe the symptoms that these brain diseases cause. But the one thing that um, I just want to make sure people understand is we kind of have a saying in, in our industry that if you've known one person with dementia, you've really only known one person with dementia. And it doesn't really matter which brain disease is causing it, because even if you're talking about every single person is suffering from Alzheimer's disease or every single person is suffering from Lewy body disease or vascular dementia. Each individual person goes through the disease and experiences it differently. So really when you use the term dementia, it's really an umbrella term that's used to broadly describe the symptoms that are caused by these brain diseases. And so, for example, the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, which is the number one most common brain disease, is memory loss and confusion. And this is part of the reason why it's so misunderstood, because so many people make the exclusive association that if you have Alzheimer's disease, you're just going to forget things and be confused. Uh, That is far from the truth. It is so much more complicated than just memory loss and confusion, even though memory loss and confusion are the, is the hallmark or all the are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's, where the hallmark of 
Um, Lewy body disease is probably more along the lines of hallucinations, frequent hallucinations, and not so much of the memory loss aspect of it. So they are all very, very complicated diseases that are damaging the brains and changing the brains. And as the disease progresses and the damage continues to uh, really cause cognitive decline in each individual, their symptomology is going to vary from person to person. Oh, and the other thing, too, a lot of people don't realize is it's not uncommon for somebody to be suffering from what we call mixed dementia. So what that means is they have more than one brain disease happening at at the same time. So it's not uncommon for somebody to have Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia exactly the same time. And the disease is, is, well, vascular dementia is caused by strokes or what they call mini strokes, trans ischemic attacks. So a person who's had a stroke or some mini strokes could be suffering from vascular dementia. In other words, the damage to the brain was caused by the brain bleeding uh, and have Alzheimer's disease simultaneously. And a lot of people aren't aware of that. This is one of the reasons why it's so misunderstood. And I have had so many family members tell me over the years, oh yeah, my mom has for example, has Alzheimer's disease, but I think she also is losing her mind and, and, and going crazy because she does all these really unusual, bizarre, strange things. And my response to that is what you're seeing is, is the disease. So it's not two separate things. They're not going crazy on top of having Alzheimer's disease. What everything you are seeing that's occurring on a day to day, month to month basis, it's all part of the disease and caused by the damage being done to the brain. So I can't emphasize enough to if you if you have a loved one who's going through this, my advice is learn as much as you can about the impact that this disease has on the person who's suffering from it. So you'll know what to look for. You'll know what to expect. If these strange and bizarre occurrences just show up out of nowhere, you'll know that it is the disease that you're witnessing. And you may um, expect it rather than be shocked by it and not know how to respond to whatever it is you're experiencing or react to it. So I think that that's really key to um, getting through this disease with um, as least amount of stress and frustration for everybody. Know how to handle any situation pretty much that comes up on a day-to-day basis because they will. And um, have a, you know, be prepared with an arsenal of tools in your toolbox to be able to pretty much address anything that that uh, comes up. For somebody that's been obviously so much very, you know, very, very affected by this, uh, you mentioned like eight family members. Now, just to put kind of like a little context of the disease itself, do you know how common Alzheimer's is? Like how many how many people are affected by it, like um, like in the United States, for example? In the United States right now, there are approximately 6.7 million people suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And worldwide, that number is about 55 million. And the thing that is so concerning about Alzheimer's disease, and we're not talking about the other brain diseases, we're we're talking specifically about Alzheimer's disease is the Alzheimer's Association and the um, World Health Organization have projected that by the year 2050, which is less than 30 years away, 
the number of people who will develop Alzheimer's disease are going to nearly triple from the numbers that we have today. Hmm. If, a, if a cure or a treatment is not found. And so far we have no cure and we have no treatment. Do they have any, is it because we know more about the disease that we're, we're able to recognize more people with it or is it a purely population increase or is there potentially like an under another like underlying issue that is going to cause it to kind of like extrapolate at that, at that, at that rate? There have been many, many studies done over the last several decades and there are many risk factors that they believe are contributing to the development of Alzheimer's disease. Some are uh, the foods we eat, uh, lack of exercise. I mean, there's, there's a laundry list of risk factors. Some of those risk factors are what we call modifiable. So if, if a particular risk factor does apply to, let's say you, Andrew, and it's, a modifiable risk factor, then there are things you can do to change it from being a risk factor and then lower your risk. But there are risk factors and uh, age is one of them. Your gender is one of them. Your ethnicity is one of them. Genetics is one of them that um, cannot be changed. So, for example, age is the number one non-modifiable risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. And it shows up typically when people reach the age of 65 and older. If you're a female, your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease is higher than if you're a male. If you are Latino or African-American, your risk factor of or your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease is higher than Caucasians. So there's three going against you right there. If you're a 75 year old woman who happens to be Hispanic, mm -hmm. there's three risk factors right there going against you that you can't do anything about. Then if, if uh, you're carrying the gene called AP, OE4. Now that's four non manageable or non changeable risk factors going against you. So your risk now has increased fourfold uh, if you carry that gene. Now, if you carry the gene, it does not mean with 100% certainty that you will develop Alzheimer's disease, but it increases your risk. Then you have the other side of the coin where there are a ton of what we call modifiable risk factors. The number one modifiable risk factor for everybody um, to developing Alzheimer's disease, believe it or not, is cardiovascular disease. So if you have a heart condition, if you have high blood pressure, if you, uh, you know, have a heart murmur or any condition that impacts or affects your heart, you are, are now at a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease than somebody who does not have cardiovascular disease. But that's a modifiable risk factor. So if you're being treated um, through medication or you're exercising and you're eating a proper diet, then you'll negate that from, at, from, you know, adding to your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Does that make sense? No, 100%. It makes absolute sense. Yeah. Yes. Diabetes is another high risk factor, but it can be managed. There's, there's a huge list of them. There's uh, sleep apnea, hearing loss, um, poor diet, poor exercise exercise habits, not um, stimulating your brain enough. So you have to take all of these factors into consideration. And the more 
that stack against you and that apply to you as an individual, the higher your risk becomes. But like I said, you can make lifestyle choices and lifestyle changes that can negate the modifiable ones and then um, you kind of, you know, wash those out. For for somebody that's obviously had this as a as a very significant part of your life over the past few decades, like do you ever like eight? I mean, that, that's a lot of people. Are do you ever just like question like why me? Like why has this been such a uh, such a huge part of of my life and and, and my loved ones? And and I'm I'm just kind of curious just how you've been able to process it individually. Well, again, my very first experience that completely caught me off guard was I was a teenager and my grandmother only lived a few miles from us. So after I got my driver's license, I started driving over there myself to visit her on a regular basis. I had always had a close relationship with her. And I'll never forget the day that I went over to her house to visit. And we're sitting in her living room and all of a sudden she started telling me that there were birds living in her mattress and that they would come out at night and peck at her face. And then she told me about the rats that were constantly running along her walls and that were going to eventually invade her home. And then finally she talked about these men who would um, break into her house and they were there to steal her personal belongings, her jewelry, and that they were going to kill her. And I'm sitting there listening to these, you know, what sounded to me like unbelievably far-fetched stories, but I'd never known my grandmother to lie. I'd never known my grandmother to have any mental health issues. But all of a sudden, she convincingly told, was telling me these stories. And it was very obvious that she was very frightened and very concerned and believed these things were really happening. I mean, who's ever heard of birds living in somebody's mattress and only coming <laughs> out at night and pecking at their face? So I even um, took her into her bedroom. And I said, let's go check this out, Grandma. So we went into her bedroom and I pulled her blankets back and I pushed the mattress up. And I said, you know what? I'm just not seeing where these birds are getting in and out of your mattress. And her answer was so brilliant. She said, oh, but Lisa, they're there. They're just very, very clever. So in her mind, in her reality, these birds, lived in her mattress and they came out and they pecked her face at night and she felt like they were really pecking her face i could find no signs of any birds anywhere but that was my first introduction to this disease and as it turns out my grandmother was calling the police four or five six times a day sometimes and reporting the birds and the rats and the men who were breaking in and stealing and that they were going to harm her. And of course, the police responded the first couple times to check it out. They, of course, couldn't find any evidence of anything. So it really got to the point where they were getting quite annoyed by her constant and frequent calls. So they tracked my mother down. They came over the chief of police came over to our house I was there and he basically said to my mom you need to do something with your mother and then he proceeded to say she's a nutcase and we can't keep taking these calls we don't have the manpower to keep sending people over there she doesn't know what she's talking about there's nothing there and you know I need to, to basically put you on notice that you need to do something with your mother. So he left and I said, what's going on with grandma? And she said, well, she has something called senile dementia. 
That's what they called it back then. It's synonymous with Alzheimer's disease, but they called it senile dementia 50 years ago. I said, mom, why didn't you tell us? I said, you know, I went over there and heard the bird story and the rat stories and all these things, but you've never said a thing. And she said, we just don't talk about those kind of things in our, you know, in, in our families. And this has been my experience even today. It's, you know, carries a lot of stigmas. It's kind of taboo. People like still like to keep it in their families because they feel embarrassment and shame. I've noticed things are changing a little bit in the last couple of years, but only in the last couple of years as more celebrities are um, coming. It's coming out that more and more celebrities are suffering from it. So things are changing a little bit, but not enough to where people are willing to talk about it. And if they're not willing to talk about it, they're not willing to, you know, kind of open their eyes and open their hearts to learning more about it. They just want to, well, let me put it to you this way. This is kind of the way I look at it. It's like the elephant in the room. It's larger than life. It's staring you us right in the face. And it's not going away. But you choose to ignore that this great big huge thing larger than life isn't really there. And that's kind of been my experience with the way people choose to deal with it. Yeah. And we need we need to change that because if we don't find a cure. And we don't, or we don't find a treatment for it. Um, we're facing a worldwide epidemic of brain disease that I can tell you right now, nobody is prepared for. I mean, there, there's a lot, obviously, to unpack. But just what what fascinates me is just the I don't know the that 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 element where people just experience this like shame and not wanting to not wanting to discuss it or wanting to share it or try to seek help in many ways. I mean, this is obviously just a very, very sad and tragic disease in itself of just this very, very, you know, disabling disease where, you know, people uh, where somebody forgets their loved ones and, and then the, the caregivers that have to, you know, live on with that. And it, it, it's sad. It, it's just, it, it's very, very tragic. And, and just this, the idea that people, you know, live in, live in shame with that is also just, it, it's troubling, all of it. I totally agree. So I've decided, I decided a long time ago, uh, probably starting with, well, not starting with my grandmother, but as more and more and more of my family members started developing brain diseases. And then I ended up getting my college degree in human behavior because I've always been fascinated by it. And it just made sense sense to me that between my personal experience having all these family members develop one of the brain diseases that causes dementia and my fascination with human behavior I just kind of ended up um as a behavioral specialist and I really wanted to help other families uh, have an easier time of it because one of the common things I've heard from family members in the 30 years that I've been doing this is help and resources and information of how to deal with these challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. So pretty much the psychosocial aspect of the disease right. is very difficult to find. And so I, I decided to, and I've written a couple books. Um, I have a training program and I just decided to dedicate my life to helping other people have a easier time through this tragic disease um, because I have had so much experience both personally and professionally that I kind of felt like 
well, as one of my clients told me, she said, this is before I wrote the book and she called me over to her house and we're talking about um, the disease for a couple hours and she stops me and she said, Lisa, you really need to write a book. And I said, well, you know, I've been thinking about it for a long time. She goes, no, I'm serious. She said, you are so knowledgeable about this disease, especially, you know, what to expect and how to handle these situations. And she says to me, she says, it would be very selfish of you not to share what you know, because there are so many families like mine who are desperate for this information. And that was my aha moment. Mm -hmm. And she's right. I had heard that from other people. And it was right after that, that I sat down and wrote the book. I had already been counseling families, but there was something about the way she presented that to me that, you know, made me agree with her and realize that what she was saying was um, absolutely true and powerful. And I decided that I was going to dedicate my life to hopefully helping other people have a more positive experience with the process of the disease so that's kind of how i got to where i i am today yeah yeah and you had you, you mentioned your book and obviously you know uh within the show notes i'll provide like links and everything where you know the listeners can you know find out more about you as well but i i want to thank you for obviously sharing the story if there's anything else that you want to say on the subject matter before we transition to a Hollywood romance. Um, <laughs> if, uh, if if there's anything else that you'd like to uh, say, if there's anything that I've maybe forgotten, or if there's one thing that you, you'd you want the listeners to, um, I don't know, uh, take away from, from this portion of the, the conversation. I just want to reiterate that if you are going through this, uh, you have a, loved one, a family member, you're caring for people, for somebody that suffers from Alzheimer's or one of the other brain diseases, it really would make your life and their life so much easier if you really take the time to understand as much as you can about the disease. So understand what it's doing to the person why their personality changes, why they say the things they say, why sometimes they recognize you and sometimes they don't recognize you um, because their communication center is heavily damaged. A lot of times they can't articulate and communicate things um, to you the way they did when their brains were healthy and th the way they um, are able to communicate with you now manifest through these behaviors that we're talking about. Like, you know, what I explained to you, I saw with my grandmother, you, it's not an unusual to see um, paranoid uh, behaviors and suspiciousness and agitation and anger. So if you know what to expect and know what to look for, and then there are very, very strategic and specific ways to properly respond and react to those behaviors. Um, and that's what I teach. And the reason why um, it's important to know is because the reactions and the responses that will kind of diffuse these situations from escalating into what we call catastrophic reactions and, you know, really big ordeals um, are counterintuitive. Our gut knee reaction in responding to a lot of these things that surface on a minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day basis are the opposite of the way we kind of instinctively want to react to them so you really have to change your paradigm about it and retrain your brain and that's through knowledge and understanding thank you i uh this is such an important subject this is one that i that i that i struggle just um just 
I don't know, your your story is just, it, it's very, very strong. It's impactful. And I suffer from crippling empathy at times. And I just want to kind of like, I don't know, you, you're, you're very, very inspiring with what you've said, but just hearing your story, like, I just want to, I just want to hug you. And, oh. uh, and um, so, so I, again, I really, really appreciate everything that you've said, but now I think the time is to come to maybe shift gears a little bit and uh, talk a little Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams. How, what do you yeah. think? Yeah. <laughs> I love right. that movie. We're going to talk about the notebook, right? Yes, yes. We're going to talk about the notebook. And full disclosure, for this conversation, it was the first time I ever saw the notebook. I knew all about the notebook, in at least the the idea of what it was. You've got two very, very beautiful people that that fall in love, and then we're getting a story about them several decades later. And I knew it was a Nicholas Sparks novel. I mean, that's that's the extent of it. I didn't really know that it was a, a story about about Alzheimer's, and and then so when we connected, I was like, okay, yeah, this this will be this will be this will be a fun ride, and and uh, the movie turned out to be something that I wasn't quite expecting in many ways. So I ha- normally, anytime I bring somebody on the show, one of the first questions I ask is, why did you want to talk about this film? Now, obviously, in the case of this conversation, I think it's abundantly clear why you would like to talk about this film. But what I am curious is, and we'll, you know, we'll take a we'll we'll take a little step back, but without getting into the plot of the overall movie, which usually, like I said, I like to start, I, but just to keep it on the the conversation of Alzheimer's. In your experience, the love story aside, how do you feel this movie handled the the Alzheimer's? uh plot point within within the film well i think this is a perfect and beautiful segue into why i thought it would be really valuable to talk about the notebook because for those who have seen it and for those who have not seen it i recommend watching it because If you do watch the movie and you see the way the disease is depicted with, you know, her memory going, sometimes she has moments of clarity. Most of the time she doesn't know what planet she's on. I think that this really, the way they depict, um, realistically depict Alzheimer's disease in the movie and the way her husband supports her disease and her family supports the, the disease are all pretty authentic and real, realistic to what I was saying, that if you understand what this disease is, how it's damaging the person's brain, and it is progressive, so it's going to continue to worsen as time goes by, as people progress through the various stages of the disease. I think that the movie really will give people firsthand um, insight into some of these behaviors I'm talking about, how it impacts the person who's suffering from it. And I think you'll agree if you've seen the movie or are going to see the movie that it really enforces or reinforces why it really is so important to understand the disease and what to look for and what to expect. And then also how to the best practices for responding to what you see. So I think they did a really good job in um, authenticating how this disease impacts a person's brain. Mm-hmm. Were there any, were there like any red flags? You're like, no, I mean, obviously in any film, there's always going to be a little bit of a uh, suspension of disbelief, but were there any from just, like I said, just on the technical level, were, were, was there anything that kind of stood out like, no, it's not quite like that at all, or anything that maybe you would felt as an opportunity they could have expanded on, on this, for example. There was, there was 
here's the scene where I heard criticism about that they didn't that people didn't see that as being very authentic or very realistic and I can't honestly say that I didn't think it was authentic or realistic uh, but there was one scene where um, the Ryan Gosling part the husband and of course this is you know years ahead of the romance part of it where He's reading the notebook to her. Yeah, Jean, and, and James Garner reading it to uh, Gina Rollins. Exactly. And she wrote the story. I, and I think it was after, I kind of get the impression that she wrote their love story in this diary or this journal, probably after she realized that she had Alzheimer's disease. Because she writes a little note in the front of the diary saying, read this story to me every day so I can come back to you. So she obviously knew that she had Alzheimer's disease Mm -hmm. and she knew what her fate was. She knew that she would eventually forget herself, her life, her husband. But there was one scene where I can see why they they filmed it that way. But to some people, it seems disingenuous. And that was the one where she doesn't have a clue who he is. In fact, she calls him Duke. She thinks he's just some man who comes to read to her every day, does not realize that the story that he's reading to her is their true love story and it's about them and she but she really enjoys listening to him read this story it goes every day and then all of a sudden one day she has a moment of clarity and she says to him this is about us right this is our story and he says yes okay so she remembers And then the part that is a little hard to grasp is she said, how long do we have? And he says, well, last time it was only for a few short minutes. And I'm not sure how authentic that is because people, and I've seen a lot of people suffer from this disease. She's acknowledging that she knows that she only has a few minutes of clarity and that she's going to go back to forgetting. And that part bothers me a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I think they intentionally did that just to illustrate the point that she she was lucid again and that they're both acknowledging to one another that it was going to be very temporary. Right, right, yeah. I think that was the reason why they included that. But most people with dementia aren't going to just wake up and just, you know, out of their demented state and say, oh, how long am I going to have this time? They mm-hmm. might have the, the period of of uh, clarity and remember their short-term memory is functioning again, but they're not going to typically realize that they only have a few minutes to remember their current reality before yeah, they go no. back to their, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm with you com- Yeah, I'm with you completely on that. Um, I mean, it, it, that moment... And I agree. But I think that moment why that even if you like I said, if you want to be technical and it's not quite like that and why some viewers might be kind of turned off about it, it does allow the viewer to get kind of like a little bit of a shift in the character like, okay, we are they're together. This is this is Noah and Allie, right? This is this is them again. They're just older. But it's also kind of that how much time do we have? Like we all had a few minutes last time. Now we're getting a little bit of that that chase moment that you get in so many love stories of like all right you know that that chase at the end where you know, they're going to meet up and they're going to they're going to have their connection and they're going to they're going to kiss and everything's going to be wonderful and the movie's over i mean so just that little 
that moment of like how much time do we have it's like all right this is kind of very very it's it's a different way of doing a little bit of a chase scene even though this movie does have a chase scene altogether this is a different kind of element to let us let the viewer know hey we're down to crunch time and we are now like in our third act of the movie and stuff is about to happen really quickly and we got to let the viewers know that you need to pay attention because we have now like created a ticking clock and it's going to it's going to run out and it's either going to be a good thing or a bad thing in the case of oh, this I movie love we see the way happens. you you explain that because i personally think that it was more for that to mm-hmm. accomplish that than to misrepresent the way the disease really plays out right. for a person suffering from it. Now, do you remember the scene where the adult children and the couple grandchildren come to visit her uh, at the care home? Yeah, and yeah. they're sitting. She's they're sitting out on the lawn. Uh, I do. Was, I remember that scene very, very vividly. Yeah, and. This is a, a, one of the scenes that I most love about this movie. And I think it's just, they just nailed it as far as being realistic and authentic. So in this particular scene, without giving away too much, you know, her three adult children, two daughters and a son and a couple of grandkids come to visit her, which they do on a regular basis. and. The father, James Garner, who plays Noah, introduces them to her. She does not recognize them. She does. She has no clue that these are her children and grandchildren. And the the way they they portrayed that and they depicted it, I loved because what they did is they had her join her. No, they had. Uh, the kids, the adult kids join her reality. So instead of sitting there and trying to correct her, oh, mom, it's me. Don't you know me? Don't you recognize me? Don't you remember? This is your grandson. This is your granddaughter. They, this is the proper way to react to it. It's called joining their reality. Because no matter what anybody says to somebody whose short-term memory has basically shut off her however long there's nothing anybody can do or say to steer them back into their reality mm-hmm. so we we have learned through trial and error that the best approach is to go along with their reality so and they did that and it was so realistic and so authentic they just went along with realizing that she At that moment, she did not know who they were. They did not recognize her and they went along with it instead of trying to force her back into their reality and cause a lot of, you know, anxiety and stress and frustration for their mom. Um, And that's really the best practice, the best way to approach that situation and they nailed it yeah no, even it, the it's grandkids a, didn't say grandma it's me they yeah. went along with it too it, it's such a well-executed scene and it, it's heartbreaking because you can see how the how her kids and her grandkids how like the uh the director nick cassavides did a really great job of like framing framing it so you can see how this disease is affecting each and even though the movie doesn't explicitly say at this point like who they are, like in relation as a viewer, you're, 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 you know, you're connecting those, connecting those dots, but you see how one son is especially troubled by uh, the situation. And you see another, I can't remember if it's a, a son or a daughter, but how they're a little bit more, I don't want to say willing to go for the ride, but they're like, all right, this is part of our process. This is what we do. And then you see the grandkids and you know, how they're connecting with uh, Gina Rowland's character. And it's, it's it's a great it's a great scene it's a it, it's a heartbreaking scene in many respects but and then the the like the you know the the scene closes out with obviously uh, the kids talking to James Garner like what are you doing like you know like do we like 
you know, like the kids basically saying, you know, like the time has come, you know, please stop doing this type of thing. And oh, I was just going to um, interject that. I'm glad you brought that up because that was the other part of that scene that I have personally experienced with the family members that I have counseled uh, where they said, dad, what are you doing? It's time to move back home. She doesn't know any of us anymore. What's the point? Basically, they were saying, what's the point of continuing to come here when she doesn't know us anymore? And he said, oh, no, she may not know your name. She knows you fit into her life some way, somewhere, somehow into her timeline. And um, it does make a difference that we continue to share this time with her Mm -hmm. and that is absolutely true. Even though the family members may not realize it, it is absolutely true. They know they that you fit into their timeline somehow, some way, even though they might not be able to put their finger exactly on it. Like, okay, you're Joe, you're my son, you're Lisa, you're my daughter, you're you know, my granddaughter, but they know they're connected to you somehow. And the way you make them feel, they may not remember the conversation they had with you or anything you talked about it or your name or anything like that. But if you bring joy to a person, that feeling stays with them for much longer than any conversation. So, and that's one of the things that I've realized that happens pretty regularly is family members stop visiting their loved one who lives in like a memory care or an elder care facility because they don't think there's any point to it because they aren't consciously aware of who their visitors are all the time. Mm -hmm. But it really does make a difference to um, to their lives. Right, right. And and that like taps into like just what like just how sad Alzheimer's is in general is just the, you know, the the loneliness that the people that that have the disease where, where they're at and then the loved ones who do ultimately kind of like feel defeated in many ways and then just put in a position like, well, I don't you know, like what's what's the point, you know, and, and all of it, it just as a collective is just very, very sad. Um, with the, the last few moments that I've got you, and obviously we, you know, we can, we can chat for a little bit longer, but, um, an hour in, I do want to cover the, the, <laughs> the, the love story element of, or at least the, the, the basic, uh, plot of the movie, not the big picture, but just kind of like how, how Noah and Ali essentially got together. So this film, if you're if you're listening and you've never seen The Notebook, uh, this is a movie that takes place in the 1940s, South Carolina, and you've got a mill worker named Noah, and and one of his buddies are out, and they they come across you know uh, some of the some of the the more affluent people in their community, and they meet Ali, played by Rachel McAdams, and Noah, played by Ryan Gosling, immediately falls desperately in love with with Ali. And naturally, her parents don't approve. Um, who is it? Joan Allen uh, plays the mother. And Joan Allen, I think, it basically has had in her contract her entire career to always play somebody's mother. But <laughs> I didn't know and, that. <laughs> and, but yeah, so she doesn't approve. And then it's kind of like a summer fling. And she's going to go off and go to college. Then Noah goes off and joins, uh, you know, serves in the war. And basically, that seemed like the, the end of their relationship, right? But... Ali falls in love with another man played by James Marsden, who also fam- famously always is the guy that gets the girl but loses the girl and doesn't get the girl back. And uh, it happened to him in X-Men. It happened to him on the HBO show, oh my God, Westworld. Poor guy. Um, but <laughs> he, so Noah returns back to their small town many years later and just Allie's on the verge of getting married and, and then they, uh, they reconnect and it becomes very, very, very clear that their rom- romance is far from over. And because I do love levity in a very, very serious subject matter, 
Um, they had a very, very iconic scene that has now gone on to be the source of memes all over the world. And the scene itself was improvised where Ryan Gosling does this, this scene of like, what do you want? Like, what do you want? And that was completely improvised in that, that whole scene, but it was so good that they kept it in, uh, in the film. And then they, they had this wonderful, wonderful makeout session, uh, in the rain, which then won the MTV, the, the most coveted award of all, the MTV Best Kiss uh, Award at the at the Movie Awards, which uh, they recreated that that kiss on stage, which now, according to legend, is something that they do all the time now. But they they're the ones that kickstarted that that tradition of recreating the kiss on stage. So there you go, little a little plot about the notebook and of course um the, the big picture is this story is all being told to us via james garner reading the story from the notebook that that gina rollins uh, or ali's character uh, was responsible for creating did i did i did i summarize that okay oh perfect you nailed <laughs> it and i think that even if you're not completely sold on on watching the movie for the alzheimer's um perspective or or aspect of it it is a really romantic love story it's a chick movie uh, yeah and, i mean nicholas sparks he he loves he loves a good chick flick or like a good love love story and it is and it it really you know, from the beginning to the end and everything that happens between these two, um, Noah and Allie, I mean, you really, really understand how they truly were soulmates. And I'm not mm-hmm. going to give it end because it's really powerful. But yeah, they they are definitely soulmates. And, and the movie just, you know, builds up to um proving that and then you know it it just substantiates it all the way through the rest of the movie right up until the end and you know who 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 doesn't like a good romance movie <laughs> i mean very well said i mean the critic the critics were a little mixed on it but the audience scores are very very positive if you go onto the rotten tomatoes website audiences through and through love the film and has an 85% audience approval score, which is really good. Again, critically, it was about 55. So it's very mixed. They, the critics either loved it or they hated it. But ah. again, unfortunately, when it, when, when it's Nicholas Sparks, uh, he, uh, Nicholas Sparks work works in the past has always kind of like tended to divide critics just on the, the notion of, Oh, it's just a chick flick, right? Which this movie and again, I part of the reason why I wrote this movie off well before I even saw it was because of preconceived notions of what I thought this movie would be. And the movie is a lot ah. more than that. You know, I, like I got to be perfectly honest, but the movie was still a massive success, made $80 million at the box office. And even though Ryan Gosling was um, an actor with with a lot of promise and Rachel Adams was an actress with a lot of promise, this is a movie that really turned them into household names in in many ways and the cast is really really huge i mean i keep mentioning them but we mentioned james garner we mentioned gina rollins but you have uh the what is it the, the playwright uh sam shepherd uh he was in the movie um james marsden was in the film and uh one of the guys that was on uh, entourage uh, was uh, Ryan Gosling's buddy. So, I mean, you, you do have a good cast of characters in this. And, you know, this movie, as you've already mentioned, you know, just on the the, the sheer fact that Alzheimer's, unfortunately, is going to become an ever-present part of, of, of our, you know, our, of our future, unfortunately. This movie is going to, I think, going to continue to resonate with audiences. Now... Mm-hmm. One final thing, just because you mentioned the, uh, the ending, I'm not going to spoil this uh, this ending for anybody or whichever ending they have seen. But there are two there are two endings to this film. One, yeah, you told me that, and I did not realize. I've only seen the one ending that I told you. Mm-hmm. I'm, yeah, I so, can't even imagine it being any different than the one that I've seen, which I right. guess I can't really 
disclosed. Yeah, you, and yeah, you saw the original crap. ending. Yeah, you saw the original ending. I saw the. Oh, that's yeah. the original ending. Well, then we'll just refer to it as the original ending. I it's, can't even imagine it any ending any other way than the original ending. And I was shocked when you told me. Yeah. Other ending is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> what I'll do is for the listeners is I'm going to put because they actually have the, the 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 two ending versions available like on YouTube. So you can you can see how one ended and how the 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 other ending. And when I say the other ending or the original ending, the original ending is the original. That That is the ending. It's just for whatever reason, when the movie was disseminated. Uh, there were there were just two versions of the of the ending, and right now the one that's available like on YouTube or the ones that have, that are available on Netflix, whatever is on the streaming platform, it has the newer version. But if you were to rent the movie or purchase the movie, it's going to have the original theatrical version, and the one that you saw is that theatrical version. But the one that that audience members will see today, if they're finding it on a streaming platform will be the uh, the alternative version which i i'm with you i you know having seen both i do like the theatrical ending more even though i think the the, the newer version it still says what it needs to state but the the theatrical version i think is is a more fulfilling conclusion and i, oh. I think maybe i'll leave it at that yeah i mean i just can't imagine um I haven't seen the other ending, but I can't imagine this particular plot ending any other way to Mm -hmm. give that fulfillment and satisfaction to closing for for closure for the audience. Right. All right. Lisa, is there anything else that you would like to say? Obviously I'm going to, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude with, uh, you know, um, referencing your book and how listeners can find you, but is there anything that you think that we maybe may have missed out or anything that you wanted or that you had on your notes or anything you wanted to talk about, about the film at all? You know, I think we covered um, some of the very poignant aspects of it, as well as um, really just capturing the authenticity of the disease. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole reason why I thought it would be a really great movie to talk about and tie it into what people actually go through, um, not only with the disease, but the families too. I think it just brilliantly captured it as being very authentic and realistic. So, um, yeah, I hope everybody has a chance to see it because it's not only a beautiful love story, but it it very realistically will give people an insight into what living with Alzheimer's disease is really like, um, you know, especially in the mid to latter stages of it and what back and what to be prepared for. Well, Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, how can the uh, the listeners find out more uh, information about your books or, or or your work? Well, I do have a blog. It's on Facebook. And if you go to the search engine and, uh, on Facebook and put in Lisa Skinner author, I, my blog will come up. And uh, my books are available on uh, Amazon and through the other fine booksellers. And I also have, for those of you who prefer audiobooks, um, there is an audiobook that um, is available. I think the narrator that we chose to narrate the book did just a phenomenal job, makes it really fun and, and easy to listen to. Uh, so I definitely recommend the audio version. And of course, that's available um, through Audible. And yeah, so <laughs> you've got my blog and I'm on LinkedIn and the books are you can pur- purchase through Amazon. Even the audio book you can purchase through Amazon. It's through Audible, Audible though. 
again, a conversation that I was really looking forward to having, but also a little worried, you know, in, in the sense that this is, you know, this is, this is, this is a real talk. I, again, I, I, you know, I try to have a little lighter fluff, but this is something that's very, very serious and very important. And, and I think you did a wonderful job, um, you know, um, you. bringing this to our attention, allowing us the opportunity to, to hear your story and to, to learn more about, about Alzheimer's. Thanks again for having me. I appreciate it very much. I really, you know, can't um, emphasize enough how important I think it is to raise awareness for people about this topic. So I appreciate your support in that. And um, you uh, had some really valuable uh, insight into this this movie that uh, <laughs> was just a pleasure. So <laughs> thank you again. Well, thank you. And again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Lisa and, and to you listeners who have made it all this way. Definitely. Uh, if you haven't already done so make sure you're subscribed to the show because we try to release new episodes each and every week, or maybe not every week, but pretty close to it. We do about 30 or so episodes a season. So yeah, definitely subscribe or visit my website, stampercinema.com. Tell your friends, leave a review, all that important stuff. And speaking of important, I think this one was a very important episode, but that's all I've got to say for today. So we will see you next time on another episode of Stamper Cinema.